right, so how long is it going to be, the uh, course, the lecture? Uh, I don't expect it to go longer than an hour. Uh -huh. Is it okay that I leave in the middle because I've got, uh, I've got other things to take care of? And will that disturb? No. Well, that's, that's fine with me. Um, um, if you could just tell me well, well, how quickly you're going to be leaving, I'll try to get to something substantial so you can leave us. <laughs> In about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So uh, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, revival of the FAQ uh, series. FAQ stands for Frequently Asked Questions. It's a series that we started um, a probably three years ago now. Uh, it was an online platform that was made available for people who had difficulty coming to programs uh, in person. So this platform is really convenient for people who uh, really don't have a bunch of time to run around to places. And it's free. So that's another uh, real big benefit to this program. Uh, FAQs is a program that's designed for you. So uh, uh, really for men. Uh, that's what we were trying to revive today is that the, most of the programs that we've that we've run so far, whether it's the groups in Muncie, Brooklyn, uh, Lakewood, uh, Borough Park, Williamsburg, uh, they're all largely attended, or really they're just four women. It really, really hasn't been a big uh, uh, demand from men to learn the principles. So this was just kind of an experiment to see what happened if we offered that for men and who would show up. So thank you for those of you who showed up. Everyone is muted now. You're welcome to unmute yourself at any time. If you're on the phone, just press star six. And uh, if you're on the uh, Zoom platform, just uh, unmute the microphone. And I do want to hear from you. So just quickly, um, I don't know if I introduced myself. My name is Tzvi Werther. And uh, you're officially now, you've entered into the Tversky Wellness Institute. This is it. The Torsky Wellness Institute is not a, a building. Uh, it's a it's an institution, kind of like marriage is an institution. Well, the Torsky Wellness Institute is an institution. Uh, wherever there is interest, wherever people express interest in wanting to learn and understand what these three principles are, what innate health means, uh, well, we try to meet that interest. Uh, and uh, this would be one more example of that. So welcome and thank you for showing up today. Uh, today's uh, talk is titled Psychological Facts. Uh, one of the things, at least when I first got into Innate Health and the Three Principles, was that uh, the conversations that I had and the programs that I attended sounded or seemed quite uh, intangible. Maybe um, it seemed um, uh, unattainable magical, uh, those types of things. And uh, for whatever reason, although that was a big turnoff to me as well at the time, I stuck it out. And we eventually found something that was much more uh, relatable, something that was mu much more applicable to everyone, to all of us, in a way that didn't really require someone to have a leap of faith. It was something that we could really all begin to understand more and more with regards to our own lives. One of the things I don't, I really don't know uh, for those of you who are, who are here, how much uh, you've already been involved in the principles. And if you want to unmute yourselves and, and let me know, that would be helpful, uh, but it's not necessary. Welcome Baruch. Okay, so I'll just launch into it. Uh, the three principles are a metaphor. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Three principles are not a, a piece of uh, a doctrine or a, a piece of information that you can master. The three principles are a metaphor. They are a muscle. They are a, uh, an arrow pointing to something beyond the words of the, of the principles. Everything that I say today is also only a metaphor. Uh, whatever you begin to understand about the principles will happen through you and you'll begin to comprehend them for yourselves. But to whatever degree you do understand them, there will be evidence by your understanding some basic facts about the human experience. 
right now in the world, particularly in the psychological world, uh, uh, on the person who's on the phone, 1911, did you have something that you wanted to ask or say? No. Okay, so I'm just going to mute you. But you can unmute yourself at any time. In the world today, particularly the psychological world, but really it's everywhere, there's a basic premise, there's a basic, a basic belief that uh, how I feel, how you feel, how anyone feels, uh, it's cre really quite a mystery as to why they feel that way. But we come up with theories as to why people feel the way they do. And one of the things that we consider as possible or very relevant as to why or how to understand why people feel the way they do is that their circumstances and the past has something to do with how they feel. It's just a, a philosophy that people have. I also have that philosophy from time to time. One of the things that become begins to become clear for anyone who understands the principles is not only is that not true, but it's not possible. And I'm choosing my words very carefully. Uh, when someone begins to understand the principles, it's not like it gives them the ability to suddenly overcome the circumstances or overcome their past. That's not what this is about. This is not about finding a tool to be able to overcome your circumstances. The principles are about understanding how your feeling got created in the first place. The principles are about understanding how a human experience comes to be, whatever it happens to be, before we be, even begin to mess around with it or try to make it different because we want to feel differently. We're not really going into the question of how can Svi Werther feel better? How can you feel better? The principles are about psychological facts about how we actually come to feel what we happen to be feeling. And because the three principles create a paradigm, a paradigm is a, a way we understand how something works. And because that paradigm is singular, it's the only way that people come to feel or experience what they're feeling. What they begin to see when, when people begin to understand the principles or what the principles are pointing to, they also simultaneously begin to understand what is not creating their feeling. And although it sounds crazy to say at first before you see the principles, but my circumstances and your circumstances, the principles show us really have no power, never had any power to create any feeling with you, any feeling within you. They, they never did and they never will. It isn't uh, fair, so to speak, to ask people to buy into that because all we get to see is our feeling and we get to see that our feeling changes and we get to see that our circumstances change. That's all the evidence we get to see with our eyes, so to speak. And so we make attributions, we make connections, we be uh, innocently, we begin to attribute the changes in our feeling to changes in our circumstances or in our chemistry or in our genetics or um, all kinds of different things that might be going on in our life. I'm not here to convince you, the principles are not here to convince you that that's wrong. The principles are simply an understanding that when you begin to understand how those principles work, you will also see simultaneously that those other causes that you thought were very relevant to changes in feeling really never were. They aren't. So we titled today's talk Psychological Facts because the principles are not about doing anything necessarily. It's not, uh, it's not an avoida. It's not an application or a technique. It's just we're asking an, a question that we maybe haven't asked in a while, and that is uh, how, how, do, how, do, how do experiences get created in the first place? I'm not asking how to change them. I'm not asking how to make them better. I'm not asking how to prevent circumstances. That's maybe for later. I'm asking a different question. The principles are, asked, are answering the question of where does the human experience become available to a person to be had? How does that happen? How do we get to feel anything? I want to know how we get to feel anything at all. Forget about good feelings. Forget about just bad feelings. I just want to know how feelings 
get to be in my realm to be experienced? That's the question we're asking in every principles forum and every innate health program where we're looking back at that question and trying to understand how does that actually work? The things that we've heard of, the two basic things that we've heard of, of uh, to answer the question about how is it that people happen to feel what they feel is there's, there's two approaches. One approach is, well, it's your nature. You were born this way. Now we know in Torah circles that that's, um, we've rejected that. A person's nature does not determine who they are and we know that there's choice involved. But that's the basic premise that we work with, that your nature brings you your feeling in the first place and that maybe you can overcome it. The other school of thought is that it's your nurture, it's your circumstances, it's the things going on around you, it's the environment you grew up in, it's your parents, it's your family, it's your school, it's your friends, it's uh, uh, the things that surround you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the things you hear on the radio or on the internet or articles that you read. It's nurture. That makes you or brings you to be who you are. And then uh, the more sophisticated have come along and said, no, it's not nurture. It's, it's both of them. It's nature and nurture together, come together to create your experience in the moment. They, they come together to create who you are. And then it's incumbent upon you to uh, overcome those things. The principles are showing us that both nature and nurture do not have the power to create your feeling in this very moment. Even from Eden, who already believe that the Ibish defeat the Welt, there's a Hashkocha Pratis, particularly in the Chesidisha approach, that even on the, the tiniest blade of grass, or, uh, or uh, a breeze that comes through the window, or a feeling that shows up in your mind, all of it is governed by the Abishter. But the prevalent view is, is that the way the Abishter brings a feeling to you, let's say, for instance, a feeling of uh, anxiety. Well, the way the Abishter does that is that he sends something anxious into your life. For instance, um, I don't know, uh, if someone's in Eretz Yisrael and there's uh, people running around with knives, uh, that has the power to bring someone to an anxious state, an anxious feeling. And so the Eibishter controls the world, and he sends anxious things into my life, and those anxious things make me feel anxious. The principles are, are asking us to reconsider that that's how it works. And that really there's a separate mechanism going on. There's something else going on that creates our feeling about the circumstances that the Abishter is clearly putting into our lives. But still our feeling about those things are created from a separate source. It's still created from the Abishter, of course. We can always say that. But the way the principles are pointing to, or innate health is pointing to the fact that the feeling that you have about what's going on in your life happens also directly from the Ibishter through a mechanism called the power of thought, which takes thinking and turns it, literally turns it into the feeling that I now have. There's the first instance I've just said for the first time a little bit about the principles. It sounds a little bit crazy that there would be a, a divine power that turns something or turns nothing really into something. Yesh me'ayin. We're familiar with that term. But we don't have to go into the Sifrei uh, Hashkafa to understand that. We see in our lives that there are things that exist in this world that we use all the time. In fact, those of you on a computer are using it right now. There are mechanisms that take one thing and turn it into something else. For instance, the screen that you're looking at is really data in your computer that's turned into, for you, whatever's on your screen. There's some mechanism that takes data and turns it into whatever's on your screen. 
It's the same thing that's happening. Well, that's a muscle for what's happening for us. The experience that we're having at any given moment is actually uh, a reflection, a direct, uh, it's a direct manifestation of a higher power that for lack of a better term right now, I'll use the term das. There's a das that we're given but that das is not in my brain. It's a das that's, a tr that's given to me specifically. And that das somehow is in the shtal shell and turns into a real full-blown experience. The principles are pointing us back to the fact that that's actually how I get to experience life. That's the fact of it. That's how it comes to be. We don't get to see dust being turned into our experience. We only get to see the experience end of it. But the principles are pointing us towards the fact that that's actually what's going on. So the principles aren't asking, aren't saying what are good feelings or what are bad feelings. The principles are not asking us to feel nicer and not feel bad. The principles are saying, look, whatever you're feeling, if you're attributing the existence or the presence of that feeling to something going on in your life, you would be outside the truth of how it actually works. If you have a good feeling towards someone and you're attributing it to the fact that they're treating you nicely, you would be outside the truth of how it actually works, or I would be outside the truth of how it actually works. I had this just a few moments ago. Uh, uh, there was something going on. There was a, 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 particularly, a particular thing that came across my desk. I was on the phone, really. And uh, I found myself quite upset about the whole thing. Now, before I learned the principles, I would have attributed my upset feeling to the fact that I received this phone call and got this information. And my proof would be this out that the, the, the phone call and the information is what caused me to feel, to feel upset. My proof for that was I was feeling fine before I got the phone call, which is debatable actually, but uh, that I was feeling, I wasn't that upset before I got the phone call. So all I got to see was the phone call and the upset feeling. And it was quite tempting to attribute that feeling to the information or the phone call that I was getting. So, easy to be bought into, to be fooled by the illusion that what is going on in your world, the way people are treating you, the amount of money in your bank account, uh, how, uh, how certain you are about the future, any of these things, it's very easy to innocently believe that those things being what they are is what dictates how you're going to feel. The principles show us that that simply isn't true, that my feeling about you or anyone, no matter how they're acting towards me, will always come back to my own das about them in that moment. That that's true, that was always true, it will always be true. I just forget it often. When I forget it, that implies or that uh, leads me down the road of blaming the world for my feelings or blaming my circumstances for my feelings. And that happens still for me. When I understand how it works, I have the same feelings. I got the same people in my life, but I understand what's going on. My feelings are a direct reflection of where my das happens to be in the moment, where my what the power of thought is, is bringing to me about you or about my world. And that would always be true, even if I can't necessarily see it, even if I don't know it, even if I forget it. The principle. Even before you learned about the principle of gravity, it was true. Even before you learned about the principle of mathematics, it was true. These principles were also always true, and they're not anything that you need to do in order to make them truer. We're just beginning to learn about them. We're just beginning to understand that how, 
how the human experience is actually being created. And lo and behold, the truth of it includes the Ibister in a way more exquisite way than maybe we were understanding in the past. So I think within, uh, at least for, for Ben, I know you need to run, but uh, I think that that's a Dover Shalem. That's kind of the first foray or examination of the principles. And I hope that was helpful for you. That was exceedingly helpful. It was very refreshing. It's the first time I've ever heard you. And um, it's been really, really uh, interesting that I've decided to stay. <laughs> yeah. I was going to go away, but I just, uh, I'm enjoying it every minute of it. Okay? Okay, great. Have a great time. Take care. Uh, anyone else on, on the line here, whether you're on the, if you're on the phone, just press star six. Uh, if you're on the computer, you can unmute yourself. If you have any, if you have any questions or comments, uh, and this program is for you. So uh, it's not just for me to drone on about whatever pops into my head. Baruch, I see you're unmuted. If you're on the phone, press star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, what, what were you going to say about the Ibishter? Um, well, I, what I what I'm what I've seen is particularly about the Ibishter, and this is what's been really shocking for me is that this is something that spiritualizes life in a way that never did before. It's something that shows the immediacy of the Ibishter in my life, not just in the physical things that are showing up, but also in my state of mind and the ideas that are popping into my head. Uh, it, 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 it spiritualizes all of life. And, and what, what was shocking about that, exceedingly shocking, was that this spiritualization that I'm talking about is not holiness or Kedusha, or Adarga. This is something that a guy appreciated. It's just true. You begin to see that the existence of life and everything that, in, that, that is showing up, including my mental life and my emotional life, is also a direct manifestation of the Ibishter himself. It is just another chilek of the oneness. Of, of the the yichid, of, of, of the yichud Hashem, and that the idea that there is cause and effect is actually stepping into a world that denies that the Eibushter is directly manifesting as the world that is showing up around me. This, of course, is not Torah. It's not telling you what you should feel or what the Ibishter wants you to feel or what the Ibishter wants you to do. That's a realm of Torah that we cannot learn from non-Jews and you probably can't learn it from me either. You need to go and find out for yourself what the Torah wants you to do in the world that you find yourself. But the world that you find yourself in is a direct manifestation. It's a direct hishtalshlis from the Ibishter himself. There's no cause and effect about the world that you find yourself. It's something that we find directly in the Svarim. You open up a Kedushas Levi, first piece on Bereshis, Ki hu hakol, me'itoi hakol, v'ashpa asoi hu hakol. It's all a part of this oneness. And we're just reincorporating into our understanding that that oneness that creates the world as we see it also includes our mental life, our knowledge, our feeling, what we see, what we hear, all of those things are directly available to me or to you through this mechanism of the power of Das, the power of thought. There's no bigger, no better author in the world that I can think of than the Ibishter himself, and he wrote a Torah. You would think that anyone who read the Torah would immediately be struck by it. But we know that's not true. You can gaze into the Torah, you can gaze into any book, and not comprehend what's being said. Because comprehension is separately created for you, not from the letters that you're reading. There's a piece in the Maranayim and Parashat Sazino that explains this explicitly. 
Um, I think the Pasuk is, Ki Hashem yitin das mi piv das susvuna. I'm misquoting the Pasuk. But there's a, a recognition that we begin to have, that even the seichel that we get in Torah learning is not coming from our effort, it's not coming from our amelis. Our amelis has no power to create our own comprehension. Comprehension is bestowed just like every other part of our reality. The principles show us that. Beginning to appreciate that the world that I see around me is a direct reflection of my own das. And that that das is in no way tethered to anything going on around me is a huge chiddush with many, many implications. Mainly, the implications that this chiddush shows us is it shows us repeatedly what is not creating our feeling. People acting disrespectfully towards me does not have the power to make me feel a particular way. Only my das does. People acting nice towards me does not dictate to me how I feel about them. Only my das does. And now we can start to actually understand without any confusion about why my feelings and my, um, my moods fluctuate so interestingly despite my circumstances often staying relatively the same, my mood will change, my feelings will change based on whatever das is flowing through me in the, at the moment because they are one and the same. My das and my feeling are one and the same and nothing can get between them. One of the questions that I get particularly from from and learned people is, okay, but isn't my... Don't I guide which das I get? Don't I influence that? Don't I make that happen through my choices? Many people will ask me. It's a quote from the Chinuch. Well, that's another question that we can look at. But at the end of the day, no matter your effort, no matter how hard you work, there's no guarantees that those efforts will create any kind of state of mind for you. Because your state of mind is a direct manifestation from the Ibister himself without any go-betweens. There's nothing in between. And if you want to do your own research further on this, you can look at a very powerful piece from the Naim Ali Melech, beginning of Pasha Stetzava. But really you can find it in all this farm they're really quite clear that your effort has no power except to send messages upstairs. Yisarusa de Lasata, our Heshtadlis, does not directly impact our world. What it does is, is it sends messages upstairs. But what comes back down is completely determined by the Amish there. So that what you find in this world will always be direct. What you're experiencing in this world will always be a direct manifestation of the Amishter. The principles are about the Amishter. But not as a emunazach or a uh, avoidazach, but a factual zach. Something that you will, almost like a science, a chachma, that this is how it actually works. And it's an appreciation that I didn't have. And the principles pointed us towards it. Again, I encourage anyone who's on the line here to unmute yourself if you have a question or you want to interrupt me. Just to review, we're asking the question, not how can I be better, but how do I actually get to be who I am right now, the, the world that I see and uh, the world that I feel, the world that I find myself in? How does that get created? And we're, uh, we're saying, or the principles are showing us, 
that the world that you find yourself in in this moment is created this moment through a mechanism called das that turns into the reality that you now see. There's a das that kind of hovers above my head or before a kudem shenivra ha'olam, and it turns into the olam that I now see. Only the Eibishter can do that. I cannot. We're not talking about something that I do. It's the Eibishter's power. But understanding that power has deep implications about how we relate to the world that we find ourselves in. That's the big deal, is that it has implications. And we mentioned a couple. One is it begins to shift the way we understand or relate to our feelings about our spouses or our kids or our friends. We begin to see that our feelings are not being held in place by virtue of some circumstance that are that is surrounding us, that really, in truth, because the Ibister is infinite, I could really be feeling anything. I happen to be feeling this one thing. But the idea that that feeling is somehow inherent in the circumstances around me begins to look false, irrelevant. And therefore, it begins to look irrelevant to begin to invest all my time in getting the pieces of my life into a particular order so that I can feel a particular way. That's a huge implication. Yeah, so I have a question. Go on. Um, could you uh, elaborate a little bit? What is the control that we have on, of our das? Okay. Uh, There's, a, there's a, a longer way for me to say very humbly that I don't know. I can just share with you some of the things that I've called from um, my rabbeim and from my chaverim and, and the sfarim. And that is, there are three areas, and only three, that you or I can put in any hishtadlus at all, and maybe even I'm obligated to put in Ishtadlis, but even then it doesn't guarantee anything. But it's our obligation. Uh, one is in the area of our mental focus, where we choose to focus our own minds, what we want to think more about. The second is what we say, and the third is what we do. Those are areas that we have, uh, we don't have any control, but we can, uh, we're obligated to make those endeavors to take those those actions so to speak but control we have none in fact what the principles are showing us is that the need to control is really something that begins to fall off our minds right now i think that most from jews believe that it's our job to control our feeling control our das what the principles are showing us are really, I think, if we look carefully in the sfarim, is that, is that that's not our job. But again, I'm stepping outside of really what, my, what, what I know certainly. I don't believe it is our job to control our das. It's our job with what, that within the world we find ourselves, which came through das, if we have ideas of what to do in that world, what the Eibishter wants us to do, we do them. If our world then changes after that, great. If it doesn't, we ask again, well, well then what does the Eibishter want me to do now? We do those things and repeat, rinse and repeat. The idea that I need to control my das no longer looks valid to me. And I know that that answer might be less than satisfying. So the question that we're asking is not so much, how do I control my das? But the question then becomes, in the das created world that I'm in, what does the Ibister want me to do? The result of those actions are beyond me, but that's really the only area that I should be engaged in. And the fum tsara agra, I think most people translate to mean that according to the how difficult it is, that's how much uh, you will, that's the yield that you'll get. But I heard a great explanation this week is that lefum tsara agra, according to the difficulty, is the reward. But there's no guarantee of how hard you work that there will be any specific outcome. 
may, may I just say something? Sure. Um, that perhaps you could understand it this way, that if you, um, knowing that, that you, you trying to control it, trying to control your dance, it actually causes you to get involved in that dance and actually causes more harm and is not the way to handle it based on what you're saying and best is to let if a negative dance comes into you and you have a negative feeling to let the dance dissipate as opposed to hold on to it which people do like you say they can try to control it and they actually keep it within yeah there's a there's a lot of how should i say uh uh there's a lot of negative side effects to trying to control your dance so I, I, if I understand you right, it sounds like you're agreeing. Am I, am, am I reading yes. it correctly? Yes. yes, yes, that's correct. That is correct. That's what I'm trying to say, that it's a negative effect. And probably that, that the implication of knowing what you've just said is that um, to handle the DAS, you, can, you will handle it better because you know not to get so involved with it, not to um, try to control it. Exactly. Is that right? Yeah, and that would be quite a huge load off of many, many, many well-intended, hard-working, avoid the Eden that I know, that are just absolutely smitten with the disappointment that they are not becoming who they want to become. And that uh, kind of uh, leads them to a yush. Whereas in this direction, there's no place for yush. You, when you reincorporate that the, the station you find yourself in as, as being a direct manifestation, directly, intelligently, perfectly, exquisitely designed for you, there's no arguing with that. It's just asking again, well, in this situation, what does the Ivester want me to do? Learn the Seal Sharm again. Okay, fine. <laughs> you know, that, that's what I need to do or whatever it is that you think you need to do. But personal change is not done by you. It's given to you in response. I heard a great, great, I mean, it's, you can go look it up yourself. If you learn, if you're used to learning the Svasemis, he quotes this and uh, many times, and it's also in the Ismach Yisrael, uh, Alexander, that we learn in the Mishnah Yogata Umatsasa Taman. So most people understand that to mean if you, if someone says I put in hard work and I succeeded, so you can trust him. But if someone says I didn't put in any hard work and I succeeded, you can't trust him. Or if someone says um, I put in hard work and I didn't succeed, don't trust him. He says a very different shot. He says Yogata, if you put in your hard work and you succeeded. But nonetheless, your relationship, your relationship to that success is one of umatsasa, which is a language that's reserved for things that you stumble upon. Hefker, animitsosia, vanimitsosia, like the Mishnah in, in Bav Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it's, it's, it's specifically referring to a relationship that I know I put in my hard work, but nonetheless, I understand that my success is a gift. Tamin, that is a person who you can trust has the proper perspective on his successes. And that's what we're starting to see is that this whole world that we find ourselves in is really a metzia. It's bestowed. And that in that world, we have things, if, if part of our world includes knowledge of the Torah and the, and the Ratzon Hashem, so there are things that we need to do. Certainly. But the world we find ourselves in is a metzia that comes directly from above and is not sourced in the world around us. And I'm really most interested in people seeing this when it comes to relationships. Because that's where it's hardest to see that our feeling, our attitudes toward people has nothing to do with them. That's where it's hardest to see that my attitude could change even if they don't. That's where it's hardest to, to take responsibility for the feeling that you have towards someone. And that's where the yield, when you do see it, is most valuable, I think. You begin to see the possibility of truly embracing and loving those around you, even if they do not change one bit. 
just to, to quote, a, a, well, she's Jewish. She's not alive anymore, but she's not a holy source. Someone once asked, uh, I don't want to say who, but uh, she said, uh, someone asked her, does life get better? She says, no, 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 life doesn't get better. Sorry, life doesn't get better. You get better. This is about, these principles are about you. They're about me, for me, seeing it for myself. Mm. I change. I find a new way to see you. The Ibishter gives me a new das about you. And then I see you differently. Isn't that amazing? This is in stark contrast to what most what goes on in most therapy rooms across the world. Where we need to revisit and confront the things that are causing you to feel the way that you do. Relive them, challenge them. This is about seeing the truth about how I happen to be experiencing life itself. In the moments that I or you or anyone appreciates that their feeling about things are coming from within them, they're in truth and that has implications. And in moments when you don't see it, which still happens, for me at least, uh, naturally you'll blame your circumstances. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, I'm just saying they both happen. Seeing the Ibister is not a choice. Seeing the fact that the Ibishta creates our experience in the moment is not a choice. Either you see it or you don't. But even when you're not seeing it, it doesn't mean it's not true. So this is just another uh, Heshtadlis, really. This gathering is just another Heshtadlis on our part to examine the principles, examine the truth, but to whatever degree you're beginning to see the truth, even right here, right now, if you're having any type of insight, it has nothing to do with me. It looks like it does, maybe. It looks like it has to do with you, that you came and listened and worked hard. Look what's happening. Whatever you're appreciating now is just new das coming to you that's manifesting in your awareness of something may have always been true, but you never had the dust before. It's happening to you now. You can see this anytime you want. It can only prove itself to you through das, not through Tzvi Werther or a book. Anyone else? Any questions? I'd like to add uh, one last thing here before we, we finish up. Sometimes innate health is promoted as being something that makes people happy, and I'd like to put that myth to bed. Uh, innate health is just something that's true, meaning that there's a system that's innate to you that creates your experience, and it's a healthy system. You can only and will always perfectly feel your thinking. I've ha I have the same experiences before I learned the principles as I do afterwards. What's changed is my understanding of it. That's what's changed. That this is not about becoming some perfectly, you know, happy person all the time. I wish it was because I could still use that, I think. Go ahead, Ben. So... In a practical level, let's say um, you're having a not good day, you're in a bad mood and you're having some negative thoughts. Do you call thoughts das, by the way? Is that what you're calling thoughts? Would they use the word as thoughts you're using das or not? Well, if you, if you listen carefully, I did not, I tried really hard to not use the word thought because it's so confused. People confuse that with thoughts in your brain, which is really a product already of das. I'm not talking about thought in your brain. So, um, so you're going through a bad day and you're having negative, uh, whatever thoughts. Um, and now you want to, what will this information which you've supplied to me 
have to be able to make it easier to, to alleviate it or was there nothing I can do? Well, here's what it's done for me. I don't know what it'll do for you. What it's done for me is it used to be before I learned the principles. If I was having a particularly bad day, let's say it's already 1230 and I can see what kind of day this is. Yeah. It's one of those days. I would then write off the day. Today's a bad day and maybe I should just dial it in and um, maybe uh, go home and go to sleep early. Uh, but now, um, I, because I understand that each moment anew is created, um, uh, each moment anew is a new experience, there's no reason to write off the rest of the day just because there has been a, a bad series of, of feeling up until a certain point. There, become, there, there seems to be an appreciation, for me at least, that what's going on in this moment cannot touch the next one. I don't know what the next moment, the next moment's going to be. And therefore I, I decide less ahead of time. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Makes sense. I think that's incredibly practical that maybe not in a, um, I can do it practicality, but it's, it's practical in that it takes things off my mind. In this case, it takes off my mind the idea that my day, this is one of those bad days. Well, I don't know, because each moment anew is, is, is separate. Do we at all create our, das, our thoughts? Say that again? Do we create our thoughts? When you say our thoughts, what do you mean by that? My thoughts. So am I creating them? Am I, or is it just Hashem doing it by himself? Again, I don't know, but here's a place that you can begin to look at. There's a, uh, a very interesting Targum Unkelis that my Rav has pointed us towards many times. And uh, it's on the Pasuk, He's the one who gives you power to achieve, I guess. Choyl means to do, I guess. Uh, Unkelis there says, who He's the one who gave you the idea to go into that business. The Svarim seem to indicate that even the ideas that come to us are bestowed. We then choose where we want to focus our minds. I definitely feel that we have that ability of where we want to focus, but even that doesn't guarantee that we will be focused. I don't think we create thoughts. I don't think we have that power. I think we're given thoughts and then we have choices about what we want to think more about. But the creation of thought is, I don't think we create anything, but that's just my feeling. I can't, I can't tell you for certain, but it's definitely in this direction. Do you see what kind of questions we ask? These are, that's a beautiful question that I'd love for you to explore for yourself and see what you find. If you'd have asked me that question, I would say that you do. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that you do create it and you choose to think what you want and, and, and we do it. We do it in our dreams. We create our thinking. I mean, it's maybe divinely inspired. It may be that Hashem has to give us permission to do it. It's like everything. But the actual creation of the thoughts, we, we sort of make a... We do that. And therefore, that tells us something that we can, if we decide at any point of time we don't want to create, keep creating it and prolong it, we just can let go of that thought. I, I hear you, I, I do. And uh, um, uh, it's a very popular view on it and a very common view, uh, but it, it doesn't hold up for me at least because there are many instances where uh, I can't let go. Um, it doesn't go away just by choice, or I can't conjure things up just by choice. And I'm not saying that we do or we don't. I'm not saying that you're completely wrong. I'm just saying there must be a bigger picture here because it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't include every situation. It doesn't help us understand totally what's happening. But uh, I, it's a great question and, and um, uh, warrants further explanation, uh, exploration. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Love your questions. Love your comments.
If you're on the phone, 9532, just uh, press star six to unmute yourself. We have about five minutes left, five to 10 minutes. I guess I just want to be Messiah that we'll end off with this. The, the principles are not something new. They've always been true. Not only that, they're not even new for you. On some level, you've always known this. On some level, you've always appreciated it. It's why you've ever gotten, ever gotten over anything in your life. We're just trying to understand it more deeply. We're trying to bring it to the fore. We're trying to get it squared away, not just as something that happens, but something that's a principle. That's 100% true all of the time without exception for everyone and every moment to begin to appreciate the fact that my reality that I see and feel is a manifestation or flowing out of these or this one source directly all at once. And seeing that has huge implications about how we approach our, our Parnosa, our Avoida, our relationships, it has big implications. And maybe in the, in, the, in the future sessions, we'll start to go over some of the implications that we've found. When we find something is 100% true, when we find a paradigm, it also shows us other things are true. And we'll start to go through those in future sessions. But for now, today's session was really just about beginning to see more clearly a psychological fact, really a psycho-spiritual fact, that the totality of my reality is mine. I'm an oilum cotton. Really? An oilum cotton? I'm separate from your oilum cotton. And that it's all flowing directly from me from this one divine source and turning into the reality that I now see, not the other way around. The outside in is not true. The fact that there's outside circumstances is true, but the fact that those circumstances dictate or create how I feel about them is false. I'm not asking anyone to agree with me. I'm just illustrating what the principles have to say. And you're welcome to have any opinion that you want about it. But if someone wants to understand the principles this is what the principles illustrate, show, and describe. More and more often, we're living, we're living lives that are more aligned with that truth as opposed to living lives that are aligned with something else. Thank you all so much for joining today. I really was not expecting anyone. All we did was send out one, one email and a text. So thank you for being on and listening and, and asking. Uh, and uh, look out for future sessions. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank a lot. It was really nice. Bye-bye.